watching from around the world. What we've been aiming to do at Innovation Days is to look at innovation in adaptation. So we started with, what is that? We moved to what is the process of innovation. And today, we look to the future of innovation for adaptation. Yesterday, we heard from a variety of different panelists. We started with Climate Kick, Afri Labs, CTCN, and Red Hat, talking about how their different organizations carry out the process of innovation differently, depending on their context, their country, their communities. And from there, we moved across and we had this Jardin talking to us about the essential conditions, what enables and what disables innovation. And then finally, we moved to the African Development Bank, who spoke to us about accelerating innovation, and particularly how youth can be used to do this. In the words of Edith Adera, she said, if you put money into the hands of the youth, things happen fast. And now we're ready to move to today. I've given you a little recap of what we've been looking at, but of course, better than myself is the director of the Adaptation Fund. I have with me Miko Olekainen, and he's gonna give us just a little bit more of a run through day by day. Catching up with all of you again, so thank you and, and welcome to, to this final session of the Adaptation Fund Innovation Days during this uh, uh, conference. I have to say I'm inspired uh, by the things and I've seen and heard during these days, um, during the Innovation Days. It's been four very exciting and dynamic sessions that uh, we've had. I'm really pleased that the Adaptation Fund was able to convene such a uh, uh, a new type of um, set of events during this uh, conference uh, with exceptional group of innovators and thinkers and leaders um, present here uh, today and this week uh, that have been sharing their knowledge and uh, wisdom with us all. Uh, since it's the first time that we are organizing the innovation days, uh, I didn't, we didn't have very uh, many expectations, uh, but I'm really encouraged by the interests that uh, all of you have shown um, uh, during these days. As you may know um, by now, <laughs> the Adaptation Fund uh, not only funds concrete adaptation projects, but um, um, also takes innovation and learning and sharing uh, very seriously. And uh, in fact, I've just summarized the three pillars of our strategy, action, innovation, and learning and sharing. Uh, and it's been really wonderful for us to engage in such a cross-linked way across these pillars with, um, with the participants um, during these sessions and around these sessions in the, in the corridors and uh, during lunches and coffee breaks uh, on the, around the theme of um, innovation. There have been so many uh, interesting insights that it's difficult to summarize them all, but uh, maybe just a few quick highlights. In the first session, on Tuesday, we, we had many inspiring remarks on why innovation in adaptation is important. Uh, we agree that accelerating adaptation is critical. Um, and while we are all working on adaptation, we must learn from each other. And we need to do that rather quickly because we know that we are uh, dealing with a challenge that has a closing window of opportunity for us to uh, really make a difference um, and to do that without having to reinvent the wheel. Technology. While it's important, uh, it's not sufficient to, for innovation. And there are many gaps, challenges, and opportunities. Uh, and many solutions for adaptation are, in fact, about nature, about communities, um, indigenous knowledge, and science. And uh, I'm really happy that we've heard from people focusing on all of these areas during these days. The importance of uh, supporting adaptation innovation ecosystems, um, which was uh, a theme that came through as well, we need to better support researchers and creators. Uh, we need specialized hubs with abilities to provide incubation uh, and acceleration support for adaptation challenges and to better harness um, the creative potential of young entrepreneurs um, uh, with specialized support and others. Uh, we also saw in the last session a number of concrete examples of our uh, Adaptation Fund uh, Climate Innovation Accelerator, the local-led locally led innovation 
uh, adaptation action uh, and many messages about what it takes and what the challenges are in designing and implementing that types of activities. So as we're kicking off the, the last uh, session uh, of the um, Innovation Days uh, here at Adaptation Futures 2023, I, I really look forward to the next speakers and panelists and um, letting the discussion continue. Uh, since it's the last time, we're not closing not right now, but since it's the last time I'm taking the floor, I'd like to also acknowledge my amazing team from the Adaptation Fund. Um, um, uh, thank you, Eleanor, for being a, an excellent um, moderator for us. Also, Saliha Dobarczyk, who, who is back there. She's uh, leading the innovation team and, and colleagues, um, uh, Markus and Nauki and, uh, and our uh, other colleagues, um, Kaltrin and Divya there. So uh, I hope uh, you've uh, been able to put the name on the face for them and you'll be able to uh, continue the discussion also after this, um, this session with them. So without further ado, um, I'll hand over back to you, Eleanor, and thank you so much for being here. Thank you, Miko. Yes, a very welcome round of applause there from the room. Thank you so much for bringing this together, and we will see more of the team who are at the back as we move through this session as well. So now we're going to look to what is the future? What is the future for innovation and adaptation? So we've brought together some people to talk to you on this, to think a little in blue skies, in bigger realms, in what may or may not be able to happen. And we start that conversation with Rob Hopkins and Bernard Koach. Bernard, would you like to come up and join me? Here is your microphone. And Rob, yes, welcome. Rob, can we have you on screen? There we go. Hello, Rob. Hello. Hi, and Bernard, is your microphone working for all of us? Testing. I yes. think now it's working. Perfect. Fantastic. So Hi, Bernard. I'm going to start with you and I'm going to pose to the two of you the question of what are the frontiers? What could happen as we move into the future? Wow, thank you. What a great question. And uh, lovely to see you all. Thank you. Sorry, I'm not there with you in person. Um, well, I mean, for me, the, the work that I do is all rooted at the community scale and community solutions to the climate emergency. Am I there? Can you see me? Yes, I can see the yes. screen the half without me on. So I'm just we looking at Bernard. Yeah. Just looking at you, looking at yourself, Bernard. So, uh, Join, like everybody who's standing there, come on, like this space is free. Come, you can sit down. Don't worry. Don't yeah. be shy. Don't be shy. We don't bite, especially from this distance. Um. So, yeah, so my work is all very much around the climate emergency and what we can do about that as communities and the kind of innovations that we can get from the community scale when we access and, and inspire and, uh, and empower communities. So the first thing I wanted to really bring as a, um, as a kind of a, an insight or a tool, I guess, for me is, is around longing is around this concept of longing and the the uh the novelist don delilo once wrote longing on a large scale is what makes history and i feel that a lot of the work that i do is really around this question of how do we cultivate longing at a time where all of our politicians seem to be going backwards very quickly on climate change and by just sort of taking all the energy and enthusiasm out of it actually a lot of the work that we need to do is really about how do we cultivate longing? And we can't do that without artists, script writers, uh, all the kind of all the arts are absolutely uh, essential in, in, in how we do that and cultivating longing. Yeah, Rob, I mean, I, I think it's fa fairly interesting also, like, thank you for teaming us up here, like thinking about frontiers, because when I'm thinking about frontiers, like my mind goes straight into like, okay, what can we do with like new technologies, with startups, with innovations, and how can we support them? Like, so, you know, talking about artificial intelligence, talking about like satellite imagery, talking about like, what can we do in terms of um, anticipatory action enabled by technology? Like there's lots of things that we can actually talk about. Uh, but it's very interesting to hear also your perspective about longing so like that's uh, would be great to hear more also about like your vision about like the frontiers here 
Well, I guess for me, I mean, I, th I think we come at this from very different places because when I think about what are the frontiers that we need, I think about we need resilient local food systems. We need decentralized energy grids that are that are in community ownership. We need to redesign uh, our local economies like they're doing in the city of Preston, like they're doing in, in, in Amsterdam now, to redesign it so that as much money circulates locally within that economy rather than just being extracted out of there all the time. We need to be making democracy much more of a kind of a regular practice rather than something we do every five years i'm really inspired one of my favorite things uh, is in bologna where the municipality of bologna noticed that there was a real decline of people being involved in democracy and so they created something they called the civic imagination office which was uh they opened six laboratories around the city where they would run big visioning exercises and then the really smart bit was that when people came up with good ideas they'd sit with them and say OK, let's make that and I, let's make that a reality. We can offer this and this. You can offer that. Let's make a pact. You know, so for me, a lot of the frontiers are around. Of course, we need national government, international government, regional government, business, faith groups, edu education system doing absolutely everything it can do, acting as if this is a climate emergency, which it is. But alongside that, there's the missing piece, which is what can we do as communities in the places where we live when we can mobilize with the people around us and start building resilient systems at that scale? No, it, it is very interesting because like, I, I think I actually agree with all of that you're saying uh, in the, the same time. I mean, I'm, I'm looking at like what technology can help us. I guess you could call me a technology optimist to that level. Um, <laughs> like, um, the, like just to give you an example, like one um, tool that is, so Google helped us build, which we call Project Sky, S-K-A-I, is essentially like an artificial intelligence tool that helps us based on satellite imagery and AI to identify buildings and damages. Now you might say like, how does this help? Now, just in the floods that were, um, uh, that we've been seeing in Libya like recently, right? Um, so the way the AI works, we can now essentially tell where where are buildings, what's the level of destruction there, and th that means like what does it mean in terms of like do we need to then actually go in as World Food Program to actually provide Im immediate emergency aid? Now we can do this with forty within forty eight hours automatically with AI. Previously, this took about two weeks of people manually looking at satellite images. This is just like an example of like how technology can help, and like we we are try or we are um, uh, applying a similar use case of AI for anticipatory action right now. Where and I think this is where you just to spark imagination. I mean, I'm giving you an example of things that are already working right now. It's still early days, but like that's where you know it's not just about a singular use of like, well, this is like technology and I'm doing this and that. It's about like the better decision-making that we can do, the better choices we can make. And that sometimes we can actually create value for everybody. Like, you know, it's cheaper, it's more effective, it's more efficient. We can prove it's working. Like a lot of things that we can actually do there. So I don't know, Rob, so maybe like the, fr from that angle, like where do you see the future then going? Like what's the, the real next frontier that uh, I think what gives you hope? I mean, I'm curious. I mean, I guess, I guess the challenge that I would put is, is that yes, I mean, of course, we have these amazing tools and, and technology at, at our disposable at our disposal. But to what extent? But they tend, to, you know, in the, in the groups and the movements that I work that that I move in, we don't tend to have access to that stuff. That stuff tends to go where the funding is and where and where the the, the investment money comes from to make it happen. You know, I, I think about a city like Liège in Belgium where the community organization Liège en Transition in 2014 came up with a really great question where they said, what if in a generation's time, the majority of the food eaten in Liège came from the land closest to Liège? They called the project the Liège Food Belt, the Centure Alimentaire Liégeoise. By 2018, they'd started 27 new cooperatives. They'd raised 5 million euro, euros of investment from the people of the city. By 2023, it's now the model the municipality is using to reimagine how it procures foods for its schools, its universities, its hospitals. And the model has already spread to six other cities in Belgium. Uh, I'm, I'm sure they'll, you know, they'll be making use of the smartest technology they can get in order to make that successful but i guess you know when you and and for me that that is a real frontier for the future is how do we move to a situation where every city is building a, a system like that reconnecting cities to the land around it a food system that, that builds biodiversity that, that builds food security uh for the for, for that place and diversifies what people are, are consuming there 
how how can the, the the technology support that because it seems like at the moment a lot of it is going into the really big industrial uh um uh sort of commercial food sector rather than into building what comes next yeah no i i, I totally agree with you like i think this is a challenge that as well food prime we're seeing like okay how can you make solutions not only applicable to developed countries, but also to developing countries and then to remote uh, communities, you know, and some of the most vulnerable people that are, you know, small the farmers, people who are actually making ends meet like every single day, maybe sometimes. And maybe just to give an inspiration on that. So one of the startups from in, in our portfolio is in World Food from Innovation Accelerator. Um, it's a startup called Ignition. So some of you know, may know them. It's uh, what they're doing. Incidentally, they're using, again, satellite imager and AI, but to provide um, essentially precision agriculture information to smallholder farmers that even are illiterate. So like they're, they already have over 500,000 paying customers, like um, individual smallholder farmers that pay for the services. And so you might say, like, how can you provide, uh, you know, a precision agriculture information to them? Well, they're using the satellite imagery and the AI, and they send text messages. So like not smartphone, but text messages to the farmers. And if they can't read and write, they just send them symbols. So the symbols uh, says, like, you know, there's a storm coming, or you should harvest now, or you should saw now. Like, these are the types of information where, you know, years ago like and I, I but this is where i agree with you rob i think like how can we and i i think make this more accessible also like or to big ag or like big companies you know how can we make things spread it to like community groups that maybe are not as affluent or like farmers that have smaller acreages like things like that that are very very interesting right yeah yeah absolutely and and i and i would just add that i i, I think that you know, we we very often end up in, and I, I know when I do talks and stuff, they're often up in in conversations about technology and the role of technology, in it, and it's really really important, as you've so eloquently set out. I think we should never lose sight as well that also alongside this, we also really need the social technologies, like the you know we are seeing certainly in the global north that we you know we are seeing this polarizing of society we're seeing this rise in the epidemic of loneliness we're seeing people losing the ability to communicate with each other and certainly one of the things that, that is really important for us in the in the transition movement which is something uh, a movement that i'm one of the people who founded which is now active in 50 countries which is supporting community groups to mobilize and come together and start building the world that comes after this one in effect is that people need to learn those technologies about how do you run good meetings? How do you facilitate events where people can come in and share their ideas? How do you manage conflicts? How do we how, how do we make sure that these movements are able to have the longevity that they need? How do we make sure they have the ability to process, to, to work with the grief and the despair and the all the things that are going to come while we're on this kind of a journey? So Gil Scott Heron very famously wrote the song, The Revolution Will Not Be Televised. I think if he was doing it now, it might be called The Revolution Will Be Well Facilitated. And I feel like actually training people to become really great facilitators with those social technologies is a really important thing to sit alongside the kind of technologies that you're talking about. No, and maybe as a as last point for me, like I think this is where what you're saying is really spot on. Like when we're working with uh, startups and NGOs in particular, I think a lot of times, they're, uh, I mean, if they're not doing this automatically, we force them to co-develop with their clients, with their users, the solution that they're actually working on. And I think it shouldn't be forgotten that, you know, you're solving real problems and you want to solve them at scale. But I think with that, we're probably at time I could go on for it hours with you rob but like it's, it's been a great pleasure to chat with you we are it's absolutely been a at time thank you so much for keeping us on time there as well and a big round of applause from the room to rob and bernard and for those of us online of course we are putting up our online hands for you both as well thank you very much for this really great to hear that bounce back as well between technology and community society so now we're going to move to our next three speakers, and we're going to have quite a similar setup to how we had before. We have one online and two in person, and we're going to have Petra Soderling, Marcus Leffold, and David Gonzalez joining us. And we're going to take the conversation a little bit more to technology, Bernard will be pleased to hear, and then a little more to government and policy before we start to move in some other directions. So please, Petra and David, would you join me on stage? And do we have Marcus online? Hi. Yes, I'm here. 
Fantastic. We're just going to hold on one moment until you're up on screen for us as well. There we go. We all see you now. Perfect. You can be on the on the top if you'd like. All right. So, Marcus, I'm going to give the floor to you first of all. Marcus, what are your views on technology taking us into the future for innovation and adaptation? Well, <clears throat> Yeah, I'm very happy that I can talk a little bit about innovation and adaptation from, from my perspective. Uh, for that, uh, I think it's important to know that I'm an academic, pure academic, and innovation and adaptation started actually with innovating myself uh, a couple of years ago. Uh, I was still a professor in financial mathematics, and uh, back in 2015, uh, I thought that I have to do something more meaningful. And that's why I turned actually to the question how artificial intelligence can help us in addressing the, the climate challenge, which I understand mainly as an economic problem. And that's where I started to dig deeper into especially natural language processing. And uh, at that time we created uh, an algorithm which we christened climate bird and that helped us to analyze corporate communication about climate uh, mitigation measures that they are taking because that's very important in order to inform investors about where they should channel uh, their their capital and information is basically what what drives my 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 research uh, maybe you remember 25 years ago there were these two uh, students from stanford who went on a mission to organize the world's information and make it universally available and useful. And that's how Google started. But one problem with information is that currently we are overwhelmed by information. Information is cumulative and you need to find ways in order to select the relevant information and make it decision useful for making decisions that actually make a change. And when I when when we were more or less finishing our research with climate bird and analyzing corporate communication, um, I thought that I have to learn a little bit more about climate change, and I wanted to read the the IPCC reports. Now the problem here is that the IPCC report is six thousand pages or ten thousand. So. We had the idea that we create a chatbot, which we christened Chat Climate. And Chat Climate is a generative AI tool that you can ask questions and you get grounded and truthful responses grounded in the IPCC report. And that was kind of a, a big move for us forward because then we also got uh, engaged in projects with the World Meteorological Organization, with the UNECE, the Economic Commission uh, for Europe of the United Nations. And they all want to address this problem. How can AI and in particular generative AI be used to extract the relevant information from all these sources of information and text and pictures and whatever we have available, this unstructured data and make it decision useful. Decision useful for citizens, for politicians, for corporations and for any stakeholder. So that's uh, my mission and I'm using uh, the, the latest large language models to address this problem. So thank you. Thank you so much, Marcus. And Petra, we move across to you. Would you like to respond to this and then also bring your own thoughts to us? Okay, here we go. Yeah, thank you, Marcus. Uh, I, I, I love everything that you just uh, spoke about. My background is also in technology, not from the academic, but from a maybe as a practitioner for 12 years, I worked in a big uh, international corporation as an innovator. And then later I founded two tech startups. Um, and then uh, in 2018, I was invited to work for the government of Finland as an um, innovation um, advisor. And for the past year I've worked for World Bank as an innovation consultant. So the, the thread in all of this is, is innovation and technical innovation. 
And then during COVID, I realized that I have a, a unique point of view that I've worked for technological innovations, pro both from the private sector and from the public sector. So I decided to put these thoughts in a, in a book. And the book is here. It's called Government and Innovation, The Economic Developer's Guide to Our Future. And it's just not my ideas. I also spent two years of doing a lot of research on the topic. And the main argument of the book is, which I want to bring forward today, is that the role of government is, is critical and cr crucial in innovation. If you look at it from top down um, as, a <clears throat> as an economist, uh, macro level, you have this triangle where you have the government and then you have academia, which is scientific research, and then you have business. And these enabling ecosystems that we've talked about this week uh, is, is it actually always the government who creates the enabling ecosystem? Whether it happens inside the university, it's a government-funded university, it's a government strategy, government chose uh, the, the, the field of study, or if it's a, a business ecosystem, it's usually in some form of government-funded uh, environment. Um, so that, that is like the, the main point that I want to bring across. Um, the luxury of being uh, the uh, speaker on the last day is uh, to be able to make a couple of observations. So I do want to bring up a couple of points that were discussed over the week. First of all is the role of startups. As a former startup entrepreneur myself, um, I feel that um, it's wonderful how we're all excited about startups and, and the innovators in, in those companies. But I also feel like often we have a tendency to be very excited about the people who are not in the room. And the startups are not in these rooms this week. Um, and I want to tell you that as a, a founder, where I put my own money and, and lost $250,000 of my own personal money in my own startup, when I was struggling and trying to pay the salaries, if at that point my government came to me and said, oh, by the way, you're also now responsible for climate change, I would have felt that it's very unfair. So I just want to bring that forward that um, startups are people too. They have families. and. They have to pay the bills. But the other more hopeful story about startup is the other question uh, I heard many times is how do we scale this? A lot of you guys, you have these wonderful um, projects that have uh, had funding, had an endpoint. How do we scale it now? And my answer to that is, well, you try to make it into a sellable product or a service. That's how you scale it. So people. Um, I don't know how much time I have, I could go on forever, but my dad was an architect and he told me that when you build a house and, and, and you do all the landscaping and everything, you have to build a house around people's existing behavior. So you, that's how you make a good house and a good, uh, good garden. And the same uh, applies here. You have to work around people, people's existing behaviors. You can't change them. People need to make money because they need to provide for their families. So if you're able to create and a business that makes money and creates money for these communities, that's uh, a way to scale. Thank you so much, Mark and, and Petra. It's been super interesting. And uh, I'm David Gonzalez. I come from a Global Resilience Partnership. But also my background started more working with uh, local organizations in the Global South, particularly in Mexico, and then going into the policy arena, working at APES and now at Global Resilience Partnership. And one of the key things that I wanted to bring today is uh, recognizing that building adaptation and resilience is, goes beyond just uh, addressing uh, shocks, right? It, it, it entails building the capacity of people to move in an environment that is uncertain and to keep the options open for, for everyone. And uh, this is not easy in all the contexts. It requires funding. It requires appropriate governance structures that allow local voices to come to the table and to be aligned with the interest of governments and of the private sector as well. Uh, but it also uh, requires building the agency for local actors to really engage in those processes. And uh, so by kind of bringing this to the table, I would also uh, like to highlight that one element that I also saw uh, as, see as a key element when we talk about innovation in the context of adaptation and resilience is ensuring that nature is at the center of the discussion. Uh, very often it's easy when we talk about innovations to focus on the finance aspects, uh, but it's central to these elements to discuss, for example, when we discuss about the frontiers, what are the natural frontiers of those ecosystems that we're dealing with? What are the economic frontiers then and the social frontiers of those contexts? Uh, so I will bring this back uh, a little bit with a question uh, to both Mark and Petra in terms of 
uh, if, if you can discuss a little bit around also what are the enabling uh, elements that uh, will be required also to move these innovations in the context of AI and also in the context of the government, what is it that the government can do to build these enabling environments for innovation as well? Mark? Yeah, so so I think that's a very good question. And, you know, I, I'm a little bit orthogonal to the startup world, being an academic. Um, I um, have, of course, the problem of funding and for the funders, it's very easy. There is no uncertainty. If the funders give me money, they know that there is no return, um, financial return. So that's very easy for them. So there's no uncertainty, and uh, I don't have to. I don't. I don't have to uh, have big conversations with the funders. Um, and mostly, of course, it's it's government funding that I, I currently have, and that's of course a big luxury for me that allowed me also to, to build up uh, the team that I have now around this chat climate tool. Otherwise, that would not have been possible. And, you know, um, Miko was mentioning something that it's also about learning and sharing. These are the two points which I think fall short sometimes when you just think about startups. Because what, what my mission is at university is really to create radical transparency. Everybody can use our tools. We open source them. There is no black box involved because, hey, we have a problem to solve. We have climate change to solve. And this requires some effort that should sometimes a little bit be orthogonal to just financial considerations. If I could uh, build on that. On okay okay uh, <clears throat> I uh, wanted to give a shout out to the African ladies from yesterday so we had both the African Development Bank and Afri Labs and what, what they were talking about was exactly this is, is, is how to have <clears throat> the component of nature that comes from the local engaging the local communities and and um, engaging the, the young people give them money and wonderful things will happen <clears throat> at the same time they had their government support and their um, public support on getting um, investments for risk investor investments into these communities. But they also emphasize the importance of international business relations with these startups, because startups are not projects that take uh, VC money and create a product. Startups are companies that need to sell their products in the market. So the, the fact that, that they're uh, building these international bridges and allowing for these young companies to um, have ties to the big international companies is extremely important. Thank you. I think we're okay. Uh, so just uh, I would like to highlight from these interventions as well that uh, one of there are five things at least that we need to build resilience, right? And these are diversity, building diversity in the context, building redundancy, building connectivity, inclusivity and equity, and adaptive learning. And I think two key elements here were highlighted that were adaptive learning and uh, connectivity, which are key to really ensure that innovation takes place. Uh, adequately uh, because yeah we're building contexts that really connect local people startups innovators with governments civil society uh, etc to build the adequate environment to build resilience and adaptation across different contexts so i think with that we'll close the session and thank you so much thank you very much absolutely a big round of applause for our three speakers it's been a pleasure to hear what you've been talking us through and to reflect on this a little bit, I'm going to invite up to the stage Tamara. Tamara, are you here? You are. Fantastic. I've dropped your microphone. Here's another one for you. Oh. <laughs> you are. I'm sorry. Let's dance. That's what we planned, an interpretive dance for everyone. Um, you are Tamara, not Carolina, so we'll make sure we have the right slide for you. Tamara, for those of you who haven't met you yet, you have been here across Innovation Days uh, for most of the sessions with us. But could you tell anyone who's online or in this room and not met you yet who you are? Bill started. It's a very deep question. Thank you. Um, I'm Tamara Greenstone Alafayo. Um, I'm originally from Vancouver, Canada. In preparation for this um, coming here and writing this bio, I realized that at 46 years old, I've lived 23 years here in Canada and 22 years in Micronesia. 
Um, so I identify both places as home. Um, and I'm the deputy director for conservation and climate change for a regional organization in Micronesia um, called Micronesia Conservation Trust. We're the smallest entity in the world accredited to both the Green Climate Fund and the Adaptation Fund. We work with large, the large donor organizations to get money down to the ground. We also do policy. We support climate negotiations and many other things. Fantastic. You described it yesterday as it not being a small island nation, but a large ocean nation, which absolutely stuck with me. From what you've just been hearing across our five different speakers, what has stood out for you? I'm sure an awful lot, but what's really holding you at the moment that can sit in the future? Yeah, this is very hard. Thank you for this responsibility. Um, yes. it's very hard to summarize this. I think uh, the first thing I wrote down, and I'm going to read because there's too many things to consider. I think the very first thing that I wanted to say is that um, thank you to the Adaptation Fund um, because I've been at a lot of meetings. We were talking earlier at my table about meetings and negotiations and all of these um, these times when we all come together. And it's very rare that we sit in a room. I, I for instance, um, sit in a room with people who are actually creating and 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 developing and and offering technology and AI and innovation. So, um, I just want want to say thank you because I think key to what we may be hearing, at least I interpreted it, is that um, we need to we need to we tend to preach to each to each other to our own. So I spend a lot of time with community and I spend a lot of time with with. Um, with islands, um, and I don't spend a lot of time with people who are creating things that 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 um, are outside of my my realm. And I feel like perhaps it's the other way around too. So I just want to say that I think that I've learned a ton, and that this conversation is is unique, unfortunately. But thank you to Adaptation Fund for for continuing or starting this conversation. Um, I also just want to say that. For me, from my perspective in the Pacific Islands, coming from Canada, of course, but spending my life uh, in, in Micronesia, I think what's in interesting about technology is that until recently, it's been very scary. I think uh, that that it's it's in climate at this at the climate tables that I've sat at. We, you know, my my um, the the people that I I support and represent have had a really strong voice, a really important voice in the world, and especially at climate negotiations, saying. No, 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 no. You guys can't continue to change the weather. You can't continue to intervene in our ecosystem services. That's the problem. You need to stop, you have to mitigate, you have to stop burning carbon and, and you have to stop inventing you know, ways to change our, life, our lives, our cultures and such. And I think, um, unfortunately, at this point where we're, we're definitely gonna surpass 1.5, I, I hate to say it, <laughs> um, and, and countries like the ones I represent are going to be and are already somewhat um, hard to live in live in i think that um the the people that i work with have have started to to see that and um i think conversations like this are really important because it, it humanizes getting to meet people who are sure making to offering technologies that seem really far really distant to the people on the ground but seeing i think the bottom line is that we're all and this might sound cliche but we're all human we're all part of the problem we're all in the problem and we're all going to continue to pay for the problem. And I think um, it's really important that we recognize that. And I do think that the people that I work with are also starting to appreciate and understand that, unfortunately, at this point, we do need uh, significant technologies. And in Micronesia, there are, we were talking earlier, there are some pretty innovative things that they're starting to talk about. Uh, Kiribati uh, and the Marshall Islands are two of the four all atoll nations in the world, the most vulnerable to climate change. Um, and their national adaptation plans are to raise their islands. And that is something that you never would have heard five years ago. Um, but what they're going to need, and again, we were talking before, that's expensive. Um, and also, I'm not sure we have the technology yet to do that. So I think it's really important, too, to continue these conversations, because if that is the wishes of the communities that I, you know, my, my husband's family is from and that I live and work in, then I think um, we owe it to them to really help them with with those problems that they might not yet have the capacity to solve. Um, and I think, again, I had a bunch of points of, of you know, the idea of, I know I, I did finish, longing and, and access and understanding and, and all of these incredible things like the idea of uh, AI robot to understand the IPCC report. Oh gosh, I can't wait to find that. Um, it's, it's already there. It yeah, exists. I can't wait. Yeah. I know, I'm gonna go Google it. Yes. Uh, radical transparency, these enabling this idea of academia and government and everybody's responsibility. So I, I don't want to undermine anything people said before, but I do have to finish. But one thing that really stood out to me 
um, was, was the speaker who said that he needed to innovate himself. And I think that he started, I think he was the first person to talk and I'll be the last person to just remind you that like, I, I really think that's where, where the frontier is. Innovating oh, ourselves. You. Yeah. Let me ask you another incredibly difficult question. How would you innovate yourself? Oh, God. Eleanor. <laughs> I'd, I'd like to okay. challenge you. Yes, that is quite a challenge. Okay, so I see it. So for me, um, probably I, I, I'm going to go back to the crutch of what I just shared. Mm -hmm. Probably it's that idea that I, because by virtue of where I, I live, I was also very, an I was anti-technology. I'll put it that way. I think there's still a lot of people who are. Bernard and, would be very upset. Sorry, sorry, sorry. I mean, I get that I have an iPhone and I fly on planes because of technology. So I'm not anti-technology per se, but... I think the innovation for me personally, and coming from Canada, but living in Micronesia and having those two perspectives is what I said before. I think um, along with the people that I work with, having to go through that process of understanding that, that, that just because that innovation isn't scary, that there's lots of really, really big benefits to it. Um, but then personally, very personally, how do I? In, how have I been able to innovate myself, or what do I want to do to innovate myself? What do you want to do? Not how have you? We're looking to the future in this session. What well, do you want to do to innovate yourself? Uh, the, oh, I can I pass? That's you, hard. You can pass. I, yes. I would rather just leave everybody with the idea of, of let's all consider that for ourselves and come back to the next Adaptation Futures Conference and I share. Think that's a very acceptable way to leave that question. <laughs> Thank that you. everybody does need to innovate themselves, and we do all have to take that responsibility. And it is unfair to ask you to okay, come up I with should, it for us. I should probably come to this again. It's a cliche, but I think innovating yourself. What I heard about that was that we have to step out of our worldview. We have to step aside from the perspective that we're used to. And we have to consider, you know, what someone else's perspective is and not only that, but how it may help, you know, this, the, the context in which we're working. Fantastic. Thank you so much. Absolutely a huge round of applause and everyone online is also uh, giving you a, a good hands up. Thank you. <laughs> Apologies for my challenging questions. So, with this first panel and then these reflections on it in terms of what the future might be able to hold, what things might be out there, we're now going to move across to another panel who are going to come up on stage for us. And they are going to be led for us by Carolina. Now I have the right slide. So Carolina is coming to us from um, UNEP WCMC. And Carolina, I believe you are best placed to introduce this next part. Yeah. Thank you, Eleanor. I'm happy that I'm once in, in that quite challenged question. <laughs> so in this mini session that we'll have, we will explore a little bit what is the role of the private sector in innovation or innovative partnerships. So working closely with communities and local, partner, uh, local communities, um, we know that it's essential. But in those partnerships or in those collaborations, what we actually want to do is do it right, including voice for everyone, being sensitive with gender issues and ensuring that consultations and implementation and all the process to implement adaptation actually is appropriate and meaningful. So in that context, the big question is how innovative partnerships can make this happen. And in this mini session, I will invite three panelists um, to explore a little bit what they are currently doing, what are um, the challenges, the opportunities. And this will be a very lining talk. So exploring the partnerships, collaborations across different scales to illustrate what businesses are doing and supporting so ecosystem-based adaptation, for example, and also exploring what are the challenges. So I will invite uh, my three panelists, if you can come here, please, and join me. So I would like to start with Madiha Chaudhry, Senior Research Officer at the International Center for Climate Change and Development. Madiha, the floor is yours. Uh, so hello, everyone. Thank you so much for having me on this panel and for this opportunity. 
Uh, so uh, my organization, ICAD, it's based in uh, Bangladesh, and uh, we are a highly vulnerable uh, country to climate change, right? Uh, so I just to, since I'm, uh, I know Carolina will start <laughs> showing me the card of two minutes, I'll just give an example from the very local communities to highlight the extent to which or the importance of the private sector. So recently we've been working with agricultural communities and farmer communities in the coastal borders of Bangladesh. We are very much prone to cyclones. So we have a lot of border structures. And so this area is also the area that's rapidly hit with salinity intrusion, right? So when we go into the farmer communities, we find that how have they adapted to climate change. So uh, when salinity intrusion increased, they transformed or moved towards saline tolerant, highly productive varieties of crops. And then adjacent communities would also start replicating that, right? But then the supply would outgo the demand given that there was a lack of the business model or the company or market out there for uh, selling these crops to. So ultimately it would be a loss of a lot of products. and. Simultaneously, it was also said by the farmer communities that they want uh, storage facilities to be able to market them over time. So these, this is where technology plays a part. This is where we need the private companies to step in and have an incentive to be investing in them. But then there is a lack of information and there's the lack of value added chain and business models in these. So we are trying to go in there with a locally led adaptive approach to see how we can engage or connect these farmer to farmer communities with the small and medium enterprises. So that's it. Thank you, Marija. You put it right away at the challenges in Bangladesh. And I would like to give the floor to Chris Hadachi, Director of Climate Change at Tech, who has recently joined the Poroteos Partnership. Welcome, Chris. The floor is yours. Thank you. Two minutes is a lot of pressure, but uh, Chris Adachi from Tech Resources. If you're not familiar with us, we're a mining and metals company with operations in Alaska, British Columbia, Chile, and Peru. I'm just going to give you a quick example of a partnership we have here that we think is innovative. So uh, in 2022, we began a partnership with a group called Ocean Regener Regenerative Aquaculture. What this partnership is looking to do is help us with our mine reclamation rehabilitation practices and to strengthen the ecosystems on the coast of British Columbia. So specifically, ORA, or the Ocean Regenerative Aquaculture, is looking to reestablish kelp ecosystems off the coast that were there previously but have been lost. What we'd like to do is take that kelp, harvest it, and use it to improve the health and the resilience of the tree species that are native on our mine reclamation areas. So this is something that, um, you know, we've got a long history of reclaiming mine sites, but we're looking at ways to do it better. Uh, and so for us, this is a great alignment where we can support um, strengthen the ecosystem health, we can improve our mine reclamation. And in terms of partnerships, it's not just tech and aura, we've also uh, invited academics from the University of Victoria to monitor this to measure it, anything from uh, ecosystem health, but also carbon sequestration potential. And then to work with some of the local indigenous communities to support the actual seedling growth and the provision of some of the, or the, the harvesting and the provision of the materials to our mine sites. Um, to strengthen that growth. So hopefully I've done this in under two minutes. That's perfect, Chris. Thank, thank you. And next up, I have uh, welcome to Jessica Brisling hicks Senior Advisor in Climate Change Resilience and Sustainability at Mont McDonald. Jessica, over to you. Thanks, Carolina, and hi to everyone. Um, for those who don't know Mont McDonald, we're a global engineering and international development firm. Um, so pleased to be here. Um, yeah, for us as private sector, um, we tend to support our clients and our downstream partners um, from a technical expertise perspective. Um, and this takes many forms in the ecosystem-based adaptation space. Um, primarily things like decision-making frameworks, um, adaptive management solutions, um, as well as project finance for EBA projects. So I'll just dive into a quick example um, of our pro project finance support. 
um, where we worked on the Water for Growth program in Rwanda. Um, for this, we supported the design of a funding instrument to finance ecosystem-based adaptation in catchments affected by climate change in northern Rwanda. Um, and this was based on catchment management plans in, um, that were co-developed with local communities as well as the government. And the innovation really came in the design and the structuring of the, um, the financing, uh, financing instrument, which included things like enterprise partnerships to de-risk projects, um, for example, river restoration projects, to make them more bankable um, in future. And secondly, things like um, payment for ecosystem services um, programs, where um, you can directly link private investment to local stakeholder needs and community needs. So the outcome here in Rwanda was that more than 4,000 hectares was restored um, at a catchment level. This leads to less soil erosion, um, less landslides, fewer landslides, um, and higher crop yields. So yeah, there's, there's a lot more to say. I'll leave it there, but of course there's always more to do in, in the scaling up space and um, standardization space. Thank you, Jessica. And it's really interesting hearing all of you. We have challenges at local level. We have interesting partnerships with academia and with the local communities. And we have also in terms of monitoring and implementing, but also in terms of creating financing and bankable projects. Do you have any reflections on the on the, on what others has speak? Some of you want to take a floor, Chris? <laughs> go ahead. I guess when everyone stares at you, you have to go first. Um, yeah, I, I think maybe I'll share two reflections. Um, one, I appreciate that this session is on partnerships because I think everyone here unanimously agrees like you can't progress anything on our own. I mean, we're all dependent on one another. Um, for us, what I, I guess what I would share is we um, on the mining side get a lot of very interesting proposals brought to us by some fantastic parties. And in an ideal world, you would partner with every single one of them, but we just don't have the capacity and the time. But what is really important in those partnerships um, are at least two things. One are these people who can, uh, you know, you can build trust with, you can work well with. But I think also, and I, I didn't have enough time to highlight this, but when we're talking about innovation, the thing I, the reason why we wanted to share the project we're doing is it's, it's ecological and it's social innovation to a degree, right? You're working with, um, in some ways it's not innovative because we used to have kelp in the ocean in some of those areas, but you know, you are thinking about the ecosystem health. You are thinking about who are you working with this on, right? And so really it's, um, it's almost thinking about the sustainable development goals and how many of those are being brought forward and can partners build that trust with multiple parties so that each project just has multiple benefits. Um, that's all I want to share. I don't know if that was coherent, but hopefully it was. Thank you, Chris. And I have a question from, I don't know if there is more reflections, but I have a question for Jessica. Uh, what do you think are the three top ingredients for a successful or an innovative partnership in adaptation? Um, three is, yeah, three is a lot, actually. <laughs> Can you give I me mean, one? <laughs> the primary one, I think, is um, collaboration. I think there are so many lessons learned um, out there. They're just not being shared sufficiently. I think you know so much effort goes into things like piloting a project. The lead up time can be like four to ten years. Um, so if we can collaborate better and share these experiences where they are transferable, um, that will drastically help with the the kind of scaling up and and the pace that we need to keep up with. Amazing. And Madiha, considering the the challenges that you has um, explored a little bit on on the case of Bangladesh, what do you think are the top three ingredients or that innovative partnerships will be necessary for, for in their case of Bangladesh. Um, also reflecting on um, the uh, thing about finance that was brought up, that innovative financing is one of the key aspects for partnerships. And I feel in the context of Bangladesh, we do have a lot of innovative financing in place. For instance, we do have corporate social responsibility, green CSR in place. So there is a lot of funding opportunities, but there is a lack of the regulatory framework to bring it down and engage the private sector into it. And 
even so firstly probably i would say the first ingredient would be having a policy and regulatory framework that decentralizes it and takes it to the very local level uh, for as well as for public private partnership and secondly i would say these companies private sector companies also need to be able to have the capacity to then use them and for green objectives, right? So I think we do do a lot of capacity building in the public realm and the government bodies, but we're now investing a lot into developing or creating awareness or capacities of these companies to actually implement it properly. And uh, I'll stop at two ingredients. <laughs> That's great, Chris. Top three ingredients for the innovative partnership I'll, in I'll adaptation. I'll just say one, and I think yes. it's when we talk about innovation, we're trying to do things differently. And anytime you do things differently, I don't know, nine to 10 times, you're probably going to fail because it's new. And so I think everybody involved in these conversations has to come with a different lens on risk and have an appetite to sometimes fail, but fail fast and move on. Like you, you need to recalibrate our risk appetite because I worry that if people don't do that, We'll just go with safe bets and, and safe bets probably don't get us moving where we need to move, right? So it's just recalibrating on risk, creating safe failure modes. And if you can do that, I think we're going to explore a lot more options and you're going to get the winners moving faster, but you, you have to recalibrate, I think, on that. Thank you, Chris. Do you want to add anything else? Perfect. Um, I can see what it's, it's also when we talk about innovation, it's not, it, it doesn't have to be so sophisticated. It could be very simple structure, partnership structure. So there is a key message there and also considering that um, the support that is needed at, at, at all levels, capacity building, raise awareness, finances. So there is a lot of learn here. And well, I think our session is tough in the, in the time we're good. Oh, that's great. So, well, I, I was just closing, but trying to summarize in the points, if anyone has more reflections there, please teacher. <laughs> I think um, I had written myself some notes here because I think I did want to drive him the point that um, we need to grow the evidence base for green versus gray infrastructure. Um, it's something as an engineering firm, we're still getting our heads around. Um, and the business case for it um, is there. We just need to be better at communicating it. So again, sharing and collaborating on, on that front is, is going to be really powerful going forward. Um, and sort of coupled with that is the, uh, the evolution of design standards so that, you know, there is a, a more kind of standardized, uh, consistent approach to these things that finance institutions don't view as overly risky. Um, they become more mainstream. Sorry, I'm just going to add on that. I think it's a brilliant point too because you need to bring governments and regulators along as well, right? We have very specific requirements. We have obligations. And when you start getting that innovative space, sometimes governments just aren't ready for that, nor would anyone else, right? Like you can't expect them to know everything about mine reclamation and all these different treatment, treatments you want to try. So um, maybe on the theme of partnerships, you know, you have to, everyone needs to be part of that conversation. You need to bring everyone along. Because again, if, if not, we're just going to be stuck with archaic regimes that it sounded very political. I didn't mean it to, mm -hmm. but you know, you need to bring everyone along for that change to occur. That's great. Marina? Uh, just to that note, I'd like to add that even for innovations, I think uh, you have to leave a lot of room for behavior change because uh, you you're working with communities that are used to a certain set of, a certain mindset, a certain way that their behaviors are moving and do witness any uh, change in that in system, you, that is where I think the whole transformative adaptation concept comes in. So I think that's very relevant to innovative and being patient and giving the room to allow for behavior change at the same time, along with that time, your impacts of climate change will also be changing. So keeping room for flexibility. Mm -hmm. And then again, your nature of hazards are also different given slow onset versus rapid onset disasters. So there's a lot of space to work in. Thank you, Mariha. Good, good point on that. And I think that's a reflection on, okay, I, again, raising awareness, being flexible, not to be so sophisticated in the structures that we want to make. And also the level of support that we, when we f build partnerships is at whole levels. And in terms of, for example, even you mentioned uh, the part of also when we create evidence, how we work with community to monitor also that 
actually the implementation is working is also a good a good point there. So thank you so much for, for this reflection are super insightful and we will hope we can continue the discussion in the networking session too. Thank you, thank you. Thank you so much. So a huge round of applause and thank you very much to Carolina and UNEP WCMC for bringing together this wonderful panel for us. You can drop them on the chairs there. That's yeah, great. Thank you. So we've been looking across several different areas as to what the future can hold for us. We've been hearing about the need of, of people, of bringing together communities. We've been hearing about the role of technology and AI coming into that, what government might need to do. We heard some words on startups as well. We started to think a little bit about what that might mean in terms of your own personal journey too. And now listening a little more about how we bring together ecosystems and partnerships to create that space. Which brings us to the next piece. We're going to move to our online team now. And we're going to be hearing from Sushi Vora, who comes from GRP. And she's also joined by colleagues from Forum from the Future. So we have Yamini Sirvasta and Sidi Asha. And they're going to talk to us about radical collaboration. Sushi, are you with us? I am. Thank you. Fantastic. We hear you and we see you. Wonderful. Great. So, Suchi, I know you have some slides to work through as well. So yeah. we will also bring those, those back up and I will click through them for you. I'm sorry that I can't give you um, hold of that, but I'll click through as you need. Sushi, the floor is yours. Thank you. Could could we see the slides on our on our screen so that great. Thank you. That's that's lovely. And I guess, I mean, I will kick off with just one statement uh, that a lot of what we heard before this was was very relevant to what we are going to talk about. We heard uh, the frontiers of building bridges, building bridges across people and nature, technology and communities, um, private sector and government, uh, and so on. And and we have we have some ideas around how those ecosystems can be built um not just ideas there there some of these are implemented uh, case studies and and I'll hand over to Yamini uh, first up who's my colleague from forum for, for forum for the future sorry about that <laughs> bit of a mouthful at 12 a.m in the night but uh Yamini the floor is yours Thank you, Shuchi. Um, I think Siddhi is going to start us off. Uh, Siddhi is my colleague at Forum. Siddhi, go ahead. Thank you. I'm having some camera troubles. Apologies for that. So I will be speaking only on audio. Uh, but yes, I was just going to echo what Suchi said again, that we've heard so many sort of statements that sort of connect with us so vividly with the conversation that we are having around connectivity, around room for behavior and mindset change and even being flexible. And so we thought that we'd take us through like some of the case studies that we have worked on over the last few years or so um, and share some insights from that. Could we move to the next slide? Thank you. Uh, with all of these change makers in the room, we thought it might be like very obvious, but we still felt like it was worth sort of reiterating almost why collaboration is important for building resilience. We all use res uh, collaboration and embed collaboration in our practice, but especially for resilience, it really helps to unearth some of these vulnerabilities, see some of the common patterns emerge amongst like mindsets and behavior. Uh, I think some people are having some trouble with the slides and you also get to start to um, learn about how you can embed resilience for design uh, changes and systems change. And especially I think something that came out at the very end of the last conversation was, how do we critically understand um, how change is being created and how do we almost measure that we are actually moving towards a more resilient system? So almost the effectiveness of the solutions that we are implementing and how do we do that in a more collaborative manner with the communities that we are hoping to impact through the, the interventions that we are designing? Can we pin the slides just to make sure? Thank you. Uh, yes, moving on to this, we thought we could bring in a we could bring in some of the thinking around systems thinking because that's where Forum for the Future sort of applies. 
um, our expertise in that sense. And we start to think about the systems as a very um, connected role of uh, change. And we thought that in the case of adapt uh, adaptation and resilience, obviously that it connects very well to the larger sort of system change around climate impacts, economic fragility, and we see a lot of these risks um, increasing in that sense. So a lot of aspects of collaboration link very well with taking a more systemic approach to change. And we're sort of left with this challenge of how do we design resilience with a more systemic approach, one that considers interconnections, one that considers the changing context, various relationships within it, and even dynamics and mindsets that underpin this. So how do we start to even measure and understand the relationships that exist? How do we start to understand how those relationships impact change in that sense? And how do we start to um, make sure that we're not working in silos, even with the communities that we're working with, and build the capacity of others to navigate and measure resilience going forward? I'll call on Yamini to take over from here. Thanks, Siti. Um, so just moving on to the next slide. I think, uh, how do we know if a system is changing? What are the kinds of things that we'd like to look for? So this, there might be changes in, let's say, system structures and flows, and that could be things like policies or laws, changes to practices and activities of organizations, maybe interventions are aligning towards more transformational goals of the system. There could be changes in resource flows, whether that's money or whether that's information or people. Um, another one level to look at is in relationships and what's changing in relationships. And this means really the quality of connections and communications between different actors in the system and changes in power dynamics and agency between them. And at a more deeper level, there could be changes in mental models. And this really talks about the beliefs or the assumptions that influence our actions and approaches. So what we thought today is that we could go through a couple of examples from some of our work at Forum for the Future. And we work on um, you know, systems uh, change in, 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 in different uh, thematic areas. And just to share a few insights from our work of applying different approaches to understand and map systems change. So just for today, uh, we have a couple of examples here. We'll just share brief insights from a couple of approaches. The first uh, on the left, what you see is a framework called the X-curve. And this is just a simplified depiction of transitions. It helps support developing a shared understanding of system dynamics, uh, the dynamics of change in the making, transitions in the making. And the other is something called a multi-level perspective. And this shows how change happens at different scales and altitudes. So we'll, we'll get into different examples. Neither of these are frameworks developed by Forum. They're well-known um, you know, tools for, for mapping and diagnosing systems change, but we've applied them in our work. So moving to the first one, the X-curve, this is a framework that helps identify the state of momentum in both what might be pointing towards a new desired system and also what might be breaking down in a current system. And this can be useful to support you know, different groups of people to develop a shared understanding of dynamics of transitions in the making. So for example, if we use this in the context of let's say an agricultural system, then we could ask what might be pointing us towards more climate resilient regenerative agriculture and what might be breaking down in the current agriculture system. When we apply this to a particular geography and the agricultural system there, some of the learnings from the process and, and from, from the findings uh, that emerged is, you know, when we found at the beginning that when system actors were not able to see the shared aspects of their vision and where and how their work contributes and fits, it, that, that, that can lead to sort of fragmented and, and, and duplicated efforts. But using a transition lens allowed for taking a step back from a busy space of activity and allowed people to look at different areas of momentum and stuckness across different focus areas and different types of work that they were doing and form a more comprehensive picture of what exactly is changing. So specifically, it can bring about a clearer understanding of you know, barriers, enablers, and also to surface and test some assumptions and tensions. So really to get to the nub of what is exactly needed to support the transition, what might be holding things back. Um, also, just the process of using this tool itself can create a space and opportunity to learn and have those conversations to learn from and, and see each other's work and, and, and learn from the diversity of work that is already underway in a busy uh, system of which is in transition. 
So very tangibly, I think what we've experienced um, from applying this tool and the process of using it was this framework really helped different change actors see and understand each other better, see themselves in the whole system and the transition. Um, they were able to identify and test ideas for critical shifts that were needed. They developed shared principles for them to work together and all of that better informed or directed their action. And that's you know work that's uh, currently underway. So that's one example. The next example is the MLP, which I will um, hand over to, to you, Siddhi. Thanks, Yamini. Uh, building again from the X curve as well, the MLP is more of a classic example of a framework that we use usually to look at change um, in the landscape and how sort of innovations and shifts are sort of taking place in the niche and how they begin to inform the larger narrative around a certain issue. Uh, you can move to the next slide. Thank you. In this case, we're hoping to share insights from uh, a case where we've used it to map action in a regenerative agriculture system, specifically in the UK. So we've got together diverse actors from farmers, growers, farm workers, landowners, civil society, and even like private sector, as we mentioned in the last um, section, last session. Uh, we hope to sort of bring together these actors, not only to sort of create a shared vision, but instead actually see levers of connection between the niche and the mainstream and how those sort of shared actions and labor connection could help sort of help them imagine how they could pivot and change the entire system and maybe what new ideas could emerge as a result of this process. So you can see on some of these, they might not be the most clear, but we ended up mapping some of the points of intervention that ended up coming out as like centering farmers, for example, recognizing value and ecosystem services more largely. Um, all of this sort of ended up having stakeholders in the system experience more of the momentum and disruption that's already existing in the system, not necessarily um, that they have to create from scratch, but already is sort of undergo under ongoing and that they can lean into. And this ended up resulting in like more ways to think about a resilient food system in the UK. They started recognizing these connective tissues amongst themselves to sort of see where they could shift even power dynamics through new ways of convening amongst themselves and sharing resources and knowledge to ensure that some of the shared vision that they're holding is actually resulting in the kind of change that they want. And this resulted as this was a result of this process that they ended up having more of these convenings after. Um, while we recognize in this part of the the session, we've actually shared only some of the tools that we've used. We do recognize that besides the tools, we also think that there is a need for the process of measurement and understanding how the system needs to change. Also, it needs to be highly collaborative and participatory, allowing for a lot of divergence and a lot of nuance. And we thought that there was some element of co-development that actually needs to take place in this whole process and co-creation. That's why we felt that GRB could share some of their insights. And so I'll hand over to Suchi here. Excellent. Thank you. Thanks, Siddhi. Um, so that was a great segue into what I'm going to talk about. Um, starting out with uh, and a little bit of an introduction of GRP, we are a partnership uh, of over 60 organizations where we are working to uh, innovate and scale um, research and and amplify and diverse diverse voices into policy climate policy around climate resilience and uh we want to see that people and places are um able to thrive and adapt to uh the shocks and stresses that they that they face um all within planetary boundaries. So that's that's uh, what we do. At, and by nature of, of being a partnership, we, we've uh, taken on this difficult space of uh, creating spaces for shared learning and creating, um, creating those spaces to hold divergent questions um, and tensions that, that the larger community around adaptation uh, and resilience may have. Uh, next slide, please. We hosted the Resilience Evidence Forum uh, 
can i have the next slide please yeah thank you uh, in uh, in june 2023 we hosted the resilience evidence forum in cape town uh, we had uh, over 200 resilience measurement and evidence professionals who considered themselves as res resilience measurement and evidence professionals ranging from community based organization representatives um representatives of indigenous communities um government uh, aid agencies uh, donors private sectors and researchers and practitioners across the spectrum and we co-hosted this with usaid uh, among, and with multiple other partners, including uh, CDKN, the Africa Research and Impact Network, uh, FAO, um, and and so on. So it was an ACAD and, and a larger group. Uh, the questions that we kind of started out with were, why, what kind of resilience evidence do we need in order to be in, in order to ensure that we're adapting and we're we're um, dealing with the the climate impacts that we are facing what are those gaps and who who are uh, the users and producers of this evidence so balancing those needs evidence needs between uh, the needs of private sector donors government agencies policy makers and communities themselves and recognizing that communities themselves are uh, users and producers of evidence. So that's that's the larger question we started with. If you could go to the next slide, please. And we landed up on quite a few uh, wicked problems or sticky questions for holding space and, and continuing to learn with. Uh, one, adaptation and resilience itself uh, requires funding, requires a large amount of funding um, even now, uh, we all know that we are finance is a critical piece, but within that space, not all investments can be standardized. Uh, resilience itself is not a one size fits all uh, solution, or and and we need to accept that there's a diversity of processes to navigate surprises to accept change to embrace uncertainty and complexity of the environment that we are working with so struggling with questions of how do we standardize metrics but at the same time how do we hold space for um, the lived experiences of communities how do we ensure that our our uh, resilience indicators and metrics are robust but at the same time simple enough for for policymakers or uh, investors to take into account in real time and make decisions and how communities can make better decisions, better informed decisions themselves through the agency that they have, the fact that they are already adapting. Uh, so those were the some of the sticky questions and I'm extremely grateful. All of us have been at, at the event were extremely grateful to the graphic harvesters and our cartoonist in residence who have created this these lovely pieces of art from the conversations that we were having. Uh, could we have the next slide, please? Absolutely, but you also only Thank have you. one minute left. Sure, yeah, I'll be quick. And um, yeah, very quickly, um, we came up with a few principles and priorities. One, that communities are at the center of decision-making. They're already adapting and there's no evidence about them without them. So no evidence about us without us was a clarion call. A balance between mixed methods and, and plural ways of knowing and, um, and the need for wayfinding between the evidence that already exists, which uh, which is critical to, to ensure that uh, we we are moving in the right direction and that pretty much kind of sums up as as uh the frontiers of of where we need to head with uh resilience evidence and measurement uh you can skip the next slide and move on please thank you and i just like to leave with the invitation to join us we've we're continuing this process of learning through the resilience evidence coalition um, we're available online. Please look us up. And there's a LinkedIn group. You can join us. And I think I'll end with that. Uh, thank you. Thank you so much. A round of applause.
So a huge thank you to GRP and to Forum for the Future for bringing us these insights and bringing us full circle, essentially, in this final session of, of Innovation Days. We started with Rob at the beginning saying that he thinks some of the innovation needs to be in how we're able to work together. And here we have some of those tools to enable that type of collaboration and how we really can come together and work together. So to continue in our full circle, before Rob, we actually began with Miko, our director from um, our director from the Adaptation Fund. And now I'd like to call up to the stage Saliha Dobatsnik and Marcus Johannesson. They're going to come and join on our seated stage where there are two microphones awaiting them. Welcome. Now, Saliha and Marcus, you, of course, are working for the innovation team for the Adaptation Fund, and Innovation Days have been your brainchild, that you have brought this together and brought everyone together across these five sessions, across these three, three days, both online globally and here in Montreal. So a huge thank you to you for that. What was your vision when you started this? Again, thank you. And I think that um, actually this is um, an opportunity to express my gratitude for uh, the Adaptation Futures, this forum that is um, basically so well suited to, I think those of us who work on adaptation daily, but don't necessarily have the time to sit down and just think and engage intellectually uh, with our fellow comrades in arms, if you will. Um, and the innovation program was actually um, initiated after the last time we came together um, face to face. So ever since then, I thought, okay, what is it that we need more of that helps us with this work and, and the innovation being such a challenging um, uh, uh, mission for the fund. Um, I was really looking forward to exactly what happened. And then I think what has uh, transpired over the last few days um, actually exceeded my expectations. I did not like Miko, um, go in with any um, specific expectations, but I know that I've learned a lot and I've heard um, so many interesting stories, um, experiences shared, and I would really like to actually quickly thank all the participants, um, all the speakers, and um, Miko has already uh, thanked our team here, but I also want to thank Alyssa, who is uh, supporting virtually and other colleagues who are um, who couldn't be here. But Marcus, could you tell us what stood out for you? <laughs> yes, uh, thank you, Sally. And, and uh, to uh, fill in uh, what you say, and maybe uh, emphasize it even more, I think uh, the approach uh, that we chose to have uh, recurrent sessions uh, about innovation for adaptation turned out to be a very a good recipe uh, in that it kind of created a co community here in between us. Uh, uh, many of us are recurrently uh, participating here and also prepared, bridged in between the sessions and prepared fertile ground for, for the next one and so on and building on into this um, kind of community here and that was amazing to see and also what stood out for me is the kind of joy and passion uh, for what you do and we do and uh, the willingness to share openly I think that's that's key and uh, um, what else that stood out which is I found very inspiring is the the um, message of how we should try to uh, counteract the risk imperative by um, building trust and also work with imagination and storytelling and basically 
start from and um, discussing where we are and how we can improve that uh, um, and turn the risk imperative to an opportunity uh, to depict that kind of more sustainable trajectory. So I really enjoyed that. And um, also the way we, we, you know, what it's pointed out all, or also here by the team uh, talking about system thinking and systems change and uh, which also also connects to how we cannot maybe rely on our traditional project approach but um, um, a much more innovative process of iterating in between uh, the different actors and and, uh, and so on and, and the fundament building the social capital um, I think I stopped there and um, um, move back to uh, Salia. And, I think yeah. yeah. So I think yeah that that really um, just about covers it. I just want to add that um, the sessions we've had and the speakers we've had, um, I found them to be quite um, uh, diverse in terms of perspectives. And I couldn't help but notice that in some sessions, we had a lot of focus on indigenous knowledge and a lot of focus on nature-based services. And in other sessions, um, almost not at all. And it really made me think of a concept that came up again and again, and it's about inclusion. We don't have a ton of time to go into um, what that means. Um, but I think that that's something that I will take home with me. I, th uh, I think that the Adaptation Fund strives to be more inclusive and to create that inclusivity at local level, at all necessary levels, I suppose. And um, I can say that this is my commitment um, in my work. Um, Eleanor, thank you so much for this amazing moderation work you've done over these days. Can I ask you all to give her a huge round of applause? Thank you so much. And of course, this is not the end. Things do continue from here forward. So to think a little bit about the continuation, we have Sean Agave with us. Sean, please, can you come and join us at the front? Can you say a few words, Sean, about where we go next and how we continue this? Yes. Uh, thank you, Eleanor. Um, Ogilvy, Sean Ogilvy. Oh, my apologies. That's all good. That's all good. Uh, Tina Koto Katoa, uh, Kotaku Pirangi, uh, Inaine, uh, Kitimihi Kia Koto, uh, Kotaku Pirangi, Kitimihi Kinga, Kinga Tangata Fino Wote, Wote Fino Wane, Kote Gunyonga Haga. Uh, the people of the Flint. Um, so uh, my name is Sean Ogilvy, as we've, it's just been introduced. Um, I come from um, New Zealand, um, from Christchurch in New Zealand. Um, I just I just welcomed you in my in our um, Indigenous language, in my language actually. I come, I'm a Indigenous New Zealander um, in Te Reo Māori, and I acknowledge the people of the of the land here, of the whenua here we call it. Um, I, I'm I'm um, really really hoping that we'll be able to. Um, host Adaptation Futures 2025 um, in New Zealand. Um, that's going to be announced tomorrow. Um, if we are able and lucky enough to be able to, to host um, Adaptation Futures 2025 in New Zealand, I think um, some, of the, some of the things that Marcus and Salih have talked about, we'll, we, we'll really be looking forward to, to advancing those things. And I think you actually touched on something that's really important that I think has come through nicely with all your work, Eleanor, and that's around and I've noticed it too, some sessions really connected um, into indigenous ways of being and others didn't seem to. So I think for me, and um, I think a really awesome way forward is to be able to bring those different knowledge systems together. Um, and we're working really hard to do that in New Zealand. Um, we, 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 from a from a local indigenous perspective, the um, it's really important that that happens. Um, I'm, I have a science background in, in environmental science, and we work really hard with our elders. Um, the way that we look at our science is that, so our, our elders have a responsibility and our, our, our key players in the environment have a responsibility, and it's been mentioned a lot around inter, the intergenerational responsibility, and they have a personal responsibility to hand environments on in a great, in a, in a good state to the coming generations. But that can't be done without all the other knowledges, the science, the 
or all the, the technical knowledge that can't be done without that. And so for us, it's actually a process of of um, of of bringing those knowledges into the indigenous knowledge system. And so a w one one way forward, which, which if, as I say, if we're lucky enough to carry on this this work in New Zealand, one key idea will be bringing those knowledge systems together. So. Um, without saying too much more, uh, I'll, I'll leave it at that. So, and thanks to you again as well, Eleanor, for um, your great work during these five sessions. Thank you. Thank you so much, Sean. Thank you. Round of applause. <laughs> Wonderful. Before I bring you just a few last closing treats, is there, is there anything else you wanted to add, Marcus or Saliha? No? Okay. Well, we spoke then at the start about the needs of art to also be brought in with technology. So we have had an artist doing some AI capture for us while these sessions have been going on. So we've been tracking what's been said, putting these into image prompts, putting those through AI image generation, and then also working on these a little bit afterwards to create these final artistic outputs. So we are also trying to bring together art and technology, as well as, of course, through these sessions, bringing together people. Any comment on what we see on the screen? We're not art critics, of course, but if something springs to mind. It's a great start. <laughs> Fantastic. And I bring you just a few more images that have also come out of these sessions um, from our same image generator there, Christian Hoffman. So huge thank you for those. And this is what I'm going to leave up on screen whilst I lead us into our very last part of this, but of course not our last part because we will all be coming together again in the future. If you're online at this point in time, you are going to be hosted by our final set of speakers that were with us, and they're going to take you through some online interaction. So I believe that you'll be working through some mentee questions, and there'll be opportunity to also put any questions into the chat, and our online speakers from before that as well will be there and available to respond to you and to answer any questions that you may have. So if you're in our online forum, please do stay and engage with that. And Sushivora, I'm going to hand across to you in terms of the online space to carry that out. If you're in the room, you have the opportunity to talk, to discuss, and to enjoy. All our in-room speakers will be staying, and you'll be able to ask them any questions that you may have. And not only that, but we also, at the Adaptation Fund, have supplied maple cookies for you. You will find them at the back of the room with the coffee. Please enjoy. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you for inaugurating Innovation Days for us. And thank you for being a part of Innovation for Adaptation. All right. I think we have we have about 14 people. I'm sorry we can't see you or directly communicate with you. Uh, but we are really pleased uh, to be to use this time to uh, get a sense from you where you're at at the end of the session and and what you think uh, were your uh, key light bulb moments through the session. So um, we have a mentee and I think I can project while uh, Siddhi, Yamini, if, if you want to continue the conversation, please feel free to take it forward. And we also have an open space and chat if you want to leave questions. So Siddhi, over to you. Uh, yeah, I can continue that. I think the question for the attendees online was just if you had any light bulb moments from the session itself, but we'd love to hear from your own context if you have any examples of radical collaboration that you'd like to share with us. And we'd love to just have an open discussion. Unfortunately, can't go both ways, but we can always capture those insights on the mentee as well. Yeah. 
Yeah, we have the Mindy up and I think we have two people who've joined. Uh, but if more people could join in, it would be lovely to have some answers coming in. You can use the code or the QR code up on the screen. Great, I think I'm gonna to jump to the answers. I think while, while Shuchi does that, if there are any sort of questions or any other thoughts that you're holding, we may not be able to answer everything, but do feel free to write in on the chat. We'll be looking at that as well. Sorry, just a second. Great, I think we have a few answers coming in. Uh, shall share screens. Great, I think behavior change innovation is something that's that's been on a few people's minds. I think I see something on chat around that as well. And there's also who are the most critical partners and how and what are we hoping to do and how do we measure it? That's an interesting question. And I think that's where there is a lot of scope for using some sort of systemic approaches to thinking about vision in terms of what you're hoping to do and even how to measure it. I know there's a lot of um, challenges in that area in terms of how do you actually measure if you're progressing towards a big picture vision, but there are ways to kind of just think a little more broad brush at a systemic level um, on what, 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 what's changing, have we contributed? We don't seem to be getting too many answers from many others. Okay, there's one more. Yeah, systems change and apply the Sorry, go on. Yeah, sorry. Go ahead, go ahead. No, no, go ahead. It makes it challenging to compare data. Are we measuring the same thing and comparing apples? I know this is a very big thing to say, how do you measure change in a system? And it all depends on what system, what are the boundaries, how are you defining it? Um, and every system within itself is highly contextual, it's highly nuanced. So I don't think you can make an apple to apple comparison, even if you're looking at, let's say an agricultural system in different geographies, it's, it's very contextual. Um, and I think the point being that we're not saying I mean, you do have to stick to very data-led evidence, you know, very tangible approaches for to see what's changing. But it's also useful to apply uh, a bigger picture lens to it, which is what we were trying to share um, when it comes to systems thinking. So just 
mapping the flows of information, power dynamics, changes at those levels as well. A lot of it is subjective. A lot of it um, will be qualitative and will be uh, things that you can't get um, the same type of data for. So totally acknowledging that, but I think that's um, not necessarily a limitation. Absolutely. And I think I would probably challenge this thought and some of the some of the um, voices that we've been hearing through our like effort to to further that collective learning is that we sometimes don't need to compare. Um, my, the you know there there are so many people in the, in many parts of the world uh, indigenous leaders local communities who are saying my adaptation is mine and i don't think we need that comparison of my system with any other system but i really need to learn from my own history and and my own trajectories so so that in itself then lends to uh, a different lens and and we might be opening up um diversity of approaches or a diversity of of uh understanding even to what that system means and and how we are or or why we are measuring in the first place even before thinking about how uh so yeah i think i think that's that's essentially a, a challenge that we as as experts seem to face at at this point these these di diverging points of view and how we hold them together yeah that's an interesting question as well building on the same thing around how do you almost co develop some of these metrics i guess around system change behavior change at a regional level and like how do you almost build in that cultural and regional nuance um and how do you even consider like lived experiences within each of those, I guess, and on some level? Um, Shushi, maybe you have something to add here around co-developing those metrics, especially. Absolutely. And it's a it's a burning it's a question, I think. Yeah. <laughs> uh, definitely a burning question and seems like a terribly tall order. Um, I don't know if some of you were part of the panel yesterday on from the Africa Research Impact Network, uh, they basically have picked up this this um, idea of implementing uh, or or launching locally led adaptation metrics and and co creating the, these with communities and feeding that uh, data back to communities and um, they they basically had um diverging obviously diverging points of view around how this fits into current processes around ndcs and uh naps but how also recognizing that people are adapting by themselves at present they have the agency to adapt with or without um with or without experts so yeah so it's it's difficult and i think um what co-development could look like, I guess co-development could look like experts playing the role of facilitators rather than problem solvers or knowledge brokers rather than problem solvers or, or knowers and um, recognizing that we don't know everything about all contexts where we are operating in, in uncertain environments and, and uh, in that then uh, recognize at ensuring that we are um, building those bridges between uh, between different disciplinary boundaries but also between experts and communities and uh, challenging notions of power it's it's a whole different set of skills from what measurement could look like in a traditional sense but it's definitely a set of skills that that we are hearing more and more that there is a need to develop so yeah I think there's also some more conversations around systems change going hand in hand with behavior change um that's an interesting point Siddhi Yamini do you have thoughts I see the comment is going hand in hand to include behavior change for the users of the product from a local level depending on experience with stakeholder as well as current situations I feel like yes behavior change is 
definitely um, one of the most important things when you think of systems change. I mean, at, if, if you imagine different levers of change, it's often the mental model, the behaviors, the assumptions, that's really where change, deep-rooted change actually comes from. And that's also the most difficult. So it's definitely part of that in that say, like in that sense to take a systems lens, it, it's implicit that you would look at behavior change also. I think when the when in the comment when it's talking about users of a product from a local level, maybe I am assuming that this is more from a let's say an innovation or an innovative product and how is that contributed to change. So that sounds much more sort of tangible and context specific. Uh, but it's making me think of one more thing, which is that taking a systems perspective is a very humbling approach. And when we talk about impact, we typically want to see results and how have we actually had impact. And that means something that is you know predictable and reliable and, and very tangible. But if you're going to ask bigger questions, like how are things changing at, at a relationships and power and mental model level, um, and how have we contributed to it? There is that degree of being very humble that whatever we did contributed, may or may not have contributed, um, but you can't directly attribute like my product or my service or my sort of initiative resulted in one big you know, system shift. You could have a theory of change where your product service initiative is laddering up towards that vision, but many other things are happening in the system at the same time. Um, so just just keeping that in mind as well. I think one of the things that we heard in uh, the evidence forum was also this uh, this agreement overall. We had we had uh, representatives from a wide variety of organizations, including aid agencies, bilateral, multilateral aid, aid, aid agencies, uh, the UN system, um, researchers, practitioners who've been following the rigorous ways of econometric evaluation, impact evaluation, and have been vouching for that rigor for a very long time. And we also had community leaders or or representatives or arts based people who are uh, um who are using arts based approaches comics citizen science games uh, and and so on to change mindsets and behaviors of people and saying that uh, we really need to think outside the box as to how we are measuring and and we at the end of sitting with all these divergent views we we realize that the community as a whole is willing to balance the community of measurement and evidence professionals these are people who are actually doing work on the ground or measuring or or evaluating it that they they're willing to accept that we need balance between the two we need balance between the rigor that is needed with uh with with quantitative impact evaluation methods, metrics, indicators, and the approaches that we've been using until now, uh, and balancing those with plural ways of knowing and being uh, indigenous heritage, traditional wisdom, and the fact that people already have the agency to adapt and are already adapting and their lived experience as they as they are adapting with or without the science. So that, that sort of, balance and that sort of ability to hold those divergent points of view has been um has been something that's really uh, strongly kind of come up in various conversations that we've had during and after the evidence forum i guess if there's is there are there i guess I have one more question probably to the audience if if people are interested but do you have we tend to sit with very complex problems but i love to end on a hopeful note so i'm wondering if you have if you have some hopes about the future and what would that that hope look like and if you could share in chat that would be great and maybe siddhi and yamini if you could share your hopes in the meanwhile
I was going to share one quick thing though about like the balance thing that you just shared, uh, Shruti, about balancing between plural ways of knowing and I think the traditional metrics of success. Uh, yep. We've actually been talking to some people working in like more complicated, more like uh, difficult terrains and different landscapes in that sense around climate adaptation. And they've been talking very actively about the role of pedagogies and like working with children. Mm -hmm in that sense, as a metric of like success, as a metric of like lever of change in that sense as well. I found that very interesting in that sense, like connected to hope as well, like sort of like using the levers of change at that level of like youth and almost younger children who aren't bound by the same systems imagination that we are or the same structural imagination that we are. That gives me hope, but that also gives me a new way to like think about how I would co-develop with a community and think about resilience going forward. Lovely. Yamini, any thoughts? Yeah, I'm trying to articulate, but I feel like the more that more of us go through these processes and experience, uh, experience just how how challenging it can be. Like these are really big questions. They are very tall orders, but it's very humbling. And I feel like that kind of incul inculcates a feeling in yourself about what you can accept, what you don't accept, how change happens. Um, and something shifts within you when that happens. And I feel that 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 contributes to your own personal kind of resilience as well. Um, so so just the difficulty of how you approach this is 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 a learning experience, and I'm hopeful that it's it's a it's a good learning experience, and it's, uh, it, I mean, yeah, it's challenging, but but good. Great. I don't think our audience is typing anything. We haven't had any hope coming in. But that's all right. I think that's the challenge of, of having a webinar mod uh, in this kind of a conversation or trying to strike this kind of a conversation in a webinar mode. Have... Oh. Siddhi, your, your voice is great. Oh, sorry. I was just saying we just have Alicia sharing in the chat. I just turned forward okay. to that. Oh, lovely. Yeah. Great. Yeah, I think larger hope that our decision makers listen to these younger voices is, is probably critical. Yeah, there's a lot Thank of hope you. in how decision making changes per se, but it's a big one. True. What gives you hope, should you? My hope. Uh I think I think I I like to see silver linings. So I've already I feel like a lot of those these these uh spaces that are more accepting of of indigenous voices, uh collective learning processes uh that's that's definitely something that i am very hopeful about and i'm very hopeful about um us being able to us as in humankind being able to coexist not just with each other but with nature as well uh yeah so very very big hope uh but yeah that balance uh and i guess that's what essentially that's what resilience is right that balance between people and nature but among people themselves and taking decisions for collective good. Great. Thank you so much. Thank you, everyone.